the published research focused on a tyrannosaur bone bed. So we're talking about multiple individuals of a single species and it was an intergenerational group. So we had uh, what we estimated to be about a four-year-old all the way up to a full somatic adult exceeding 20 years in age and three growth stages in between. This is the first such uh, tyrannosaur bone bed found in the southern U.S. There have been a couple found in the northern Great Plains area um, in Montana and Alberta, Canada. But this is the first in the southern U.S. and it features a taxon that's endemic to the southern U.S., uh, an animal named Teratophonia. So a completely different lineage of tyrannosaur. And yet in, in the final analysis, uh, the features of the site are remarkably similar with the previously reported sites in Montana and Alberta. So the implications are the animals died as a result of a single mass mortality event rather than through some sort of attritional process. And therefore, you took a standing crop of animals rather than pulling in individuals over some period of time. Uh, you can conclude that if you took a standing crop of multi-individual or uh, multi-generational tyrannosaurs, that there could this could be reflecting some sort of social behavior, some sort of uh, parasocial or gregarious behavior, something they were doing routinely. And uh, if it were just one site, you could probably say, okay, maybe we could generate this site through a variety of circumstances. Uh, you know, maybe a fire drove them in or or maybe flood waters washed them from various parts of the floodplain uh, and, and gathered them in a, in a hydraulic setting where they congregated and before everything settled out. But because we now have three of these sites throughout the Western interior of North America, we're saying this pattern is such a statistically improbable event that if it were just, if these individual sites were just being created by circumstance alone and not reflecting any of the behavior of the tyrannosaurs, that, that this wouldn't be such a pervasive pattern. We're actually seeing this pattern repeat itself, be, not because of circumstance, but because the behavior of tyrannosaurs is creating a predisposition for sites like this to happen, just as in gregariousness in uh, ceratopsians is creating these large bone beds up in Montana and Alberta. You know, these huge centrosaur bone beds don't happen because we're washing uh, isolated centrosaurs in from various places. They're, they're happening because the animals are gregarious. We're making the same argument for tyrannosaurs. Well, I'm uh, Dr. Alan Titus, uh, paleontologist for the Perea River District for the uh, U.S. Bureau of Land Management in Southern Utah. I live in Kanab. Um, and I was formerly the monument paleontologist for Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, where uh, the research that we published um, was centered on. Uh, my co-authors include Dr. Selena Suarez, it's an isotopic geochemist from the University of Arkansas. I have the curator of dinosaurs, Dr. Joe Serdich from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. I have uh, Katya Canole, who is the lab manager here uh, at the Perea River District and also works for the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, Dr. Ian Glasspool, who was formerly of the Field Museum, now teaching at Colby College, and he was our charcoal expert uh, gave us insights into the into the burned wood that we found among the dinosaur bones. Uh, and then we have Dr. Eric Roberts from James Cook University in Australia, Queensland, uh, who is a stratigrapher and a sedimentologist and helped us put the site into the overall uh, geological context and, and date it as well. And then uh, we have uh, Abigail Lukasik and Jonathan Genevis who were interns working with us that uh, helped us with all the taphonomy on the bones and assessing the weathering stages and, and how advanced decomposition was on the skeletons before they were buried. We've made essentially a geological argument that these tyrannosaurs died as a group. Um, our next step would to be to make a biological argument that these tyrannosaurs uh, were social or para, not social is the wrong term, parasocial. So true sociality is actually something we only see in naked mole rats, ants, and termites, things like that. But, um, 
but we're talking about parasocial behavior, more like wolves or lions. And um, uh, like I say, we want to make a geochemical argument um, for the for the biology of the animals. Were they living and feeding in the same ecospace, utilizing the same food resources? Well, we should be able to show that with stable carbon and oxygen isotope analysis of the growth series, which we haven't done yet. And so that'll be um, certainly one of the next steps for this research. It, when, when we looked at the volume of evidence that we'd assembled and, uh, and the length of the manuscript that we realized we were going to generate with this study, um, because it was interdisciplinary and we'd, we'd pulled in you know, charcoal specialists and geochemists and stratigraphers and dinosaur taxonomists and me, the, the, the basic geologist, um, paleontologist, um, we had so much evidence and we wanted it all out on the table for the world to see. We didn't want to have to gloss over any of it. We wanted people to see the gory details of everything we did. I mean, we even ran, you know, the, the clay fraction analysis and and uh, did rare earths and everything. And we wanted this all in one nice finite paper that people could access. Well, its length turned out to be 50 published pages, which for a regular journal is somewhat cumbersome and expensive. And I just feel like Pierre J um, was a, with their, their format and um, you know, the use of color and everything else that uh, it, it was a logical place for us to take such a, a volume of, uh, of results. So, and it worked wonderfully. I mean, the editors were great. Everything was timely. Um, you know, there was good communication and uh, we really appreciate the effort that Pierre J made to help us get this uh, out.